Oh, so I guess it's time to introduce our next invited speaker. So it's an honor to introduce John Harrison, who uh, will give the first Ichkar uh, invited talk. So John did his PhD in Cambridge with Mike Gordon on theorem proving the serial numbers. And since then, he worked on many aspects of interactive and automated theorem proving and formal verification at companies like Intel and Amazon. Uh, and I think he is one of the most efficient formalizers. And uh, to list all of his achievements would be would be just too long. So let me mention just just a few. He is well known as the author of the whole light proof assistant that has been used, for example, among many other things for the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture uh, led by Tom Hales. And he also did great contributions to, to that project. His, his day job has been floating point and other verifications and Intel and later at Amazon, while his night job, as he likes to say, is sort of formalizing math. Uh, he spearheaded the self-verification of Hall, uh, worked on bridges to computer algebra systems, implemented many decision procedures and tactics, authored the handbook of practical logic uh, and automated reasoning, formalized topology, multivariate analysis, and many other fields in whole light. And for a long time, he has been single-handedly the leader of the of the Frey Quidex list of of the formalizations of the 100 theorems. Uh, already as a PhD student, he participated in both QED workshops and got influenced and influenced many other people. And for example, despite using HOL and writing his uh, sort of incomprehensible tactical truth scripts. He has been actually the first Westerner who transferred the declarative, the, the sort of Mizar way of writing formal proofs. Uh, and uh, despite being an HOL light person in 2018, he also gave a talk called Let's Make Set Theory Great Again, uh, showing uh, sort of his uh, interest in alternative uh, foundations for uh, theorem proving. So the topic of his today's talk is adventures in verifying arithmetic. And I'm really curious what this will be about. And John, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, um... The nice introduction. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. If, you, if if there's any problem with the audio or the video, just yeah, just let me can. know. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, I'll just keep an eye on my battery. Okay. So yeah, this this talk is entitled "Adventures in Verifying Arithmetic," and it's talking a little bit more about the work I do in uh, what you have described as my day job, that is verifying stuff. Um, so. In my recent uh, career, in my my day job, so to speak, um, for a long time I was doing, I was working at Intel doing uh, verification of floating point arithmetic things, uh, that is, uh, floating point algorithms and uh, implementations of floating point operations. Uh, more recently, for the last couple of years, I've been working on uh, verification of big num type. Um, things at Amazon Web Services. And clearly there's the unifying theme that these are all arithmetic in some sense. <clears throat> um, you might say that I'm going from, from real number arithmetic to, to arithmetic on the integers, broadly speaking. And there are lots of both similarities and differences between these two domains over the sort of floating point real stuff and the uh, crypto big num stuff that I think are somewhat interesting. There are both similarities and differences with respect to the functions themselves, the requirements for efficiency and things like that. There are similarities and differences in the kind of mathematics you have to formalize in the special inference rules that are particularly useful in these applications. 
but but some common themes emerge, uh, which I've tried to pick out. Uh, in particular, the, the the fact that some kind of formal interval bounds are, are a generically useful idea in both settings, and also ideas that superficially look rather different are really mathematically very closely related, like say Newton's method on the reals versus Hensel lifting on the integers. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and another common feature is that a lot of this is at the level of quite low level machine code type verification. And so this brings up the topics of modeling the instruction set architecture. That's what, what I mean by ISA. Um, and doing some kind of continuous integration to make sure you're really verifying what you think you're verifying. So essentially, I'm just going to try and give you a little overview of, of my work in both domains and touch on, on a few of these points. Um, so here's a picture of a much younger me back in uh, 2006 at the floating point, the IEEE floating point standardization meetings. There was an effort to standardize uh, afresh the IEEE floating point standard and I was um, among the representatives at that meeting. Uh, so here I am surrounded by floating point luminaries. And at that point, I was really just doing uh, floating point arithmetic. So, you know, functions for floating point division, floating point transcendental functions like sine and cosine. And that was the main focus of my, my verification. So time has moved on. And so here's, here's a more recent picture of me with some formal verification people at Amazon. There I am lurking at the back of the group. And all these years later, I'm now verifying something somewhat different, but it's still in a broad sense arithmetic. Uh, but this time it's more like big number arithmetic for cryptographic applications. So what's, what's the same and what's different about these two domains? Well, first of all, my job, my first job is to make sure these things are functionally correct. So both the floating point and the uh, crypto big num stuff are supposed to be mathematically correct. Um, of course, the conception of what mathematically correct um, means needs to be stated precisely. So uh, for example, for many floating point functions, there's a pretty much completely deterministic answer. Like if you do a IEEE standard floating point addition, then with very few exceptions around NANDs, there's a specific right answer and you're supposed to give that right answer. For some other floating point functions like transcendental functions, typically there's a, there's a not completely deterministic specification like the mathematical accuracy must be within 0.52 units in the last place. And all this applies equally, of course, to the, um, the big num work. You're just supposed to give the, the mathematically right answer. In both cases, also the implementations are intended to be fast because these are things that are actually going to be used in real life, used every day in production, and sometimes are going to be used in the inner core of some other um, functions. So they're, the ideal is that they're mathematically correct and also fast. In the cryptographic setting, there's very often, there are very often some additional requirements that are motivated by security. Uh, in particular, they're often intended to be what's very roughly called constant time. What this roughly means is that the execution time of the function, as well as some other obser potentially observable characteristics like its memory access pattern, should ideally be independent of, or at least uncorrelated with, uh, the data that you're manipulating. The idea here is that there are various ingenious side channel attacks where potentially observers by looking at, you know, the, the time your encryption or decryption operation takes or its access patterns or its cache um, behavior can deviously infer things about private data. And so very often code is written in what at first sight looks a rather obscure style to try to make it, um, immune or at least uh, more close to being immune to these kinds of, of side channel attacks. So very often uh, in cryptographic applications, uh, 
yes, in general, one cares about the best, the average case time, but one may actually care more about making that time more or less constant or stable. Um, and depending on the exact application, you know, whether you're doing things with a private key or a public key, for example, that may well take precedence over average case speed. So actually this kind of constant time style does come up in floating point too. So there were times when I was designing floating point algorithms when it made sense to avoid control flow or data dependent control flow because that allows you to get better parallelism using things like these single instruction, multiple data stream uh, operations that are available uh, both for floating point and integer. But it's but it it's a particular focus with with the crypto code. So a lot of the cryptographic code I've been writing and verifying by design does not have very many conventional control flow uh, constructs. So insofar as it has loops and case statements, those are usually only branches on things like data size, not the actual data contents. So very often the code has a slightly obfuscated look. So just um, uh, to give you an example, uh, and this, by the way, motivates the fact that we're mostly writing and verifying the code at quite a low level because it gives you control over these questions. So here's a somewhat random extract from some of the machine code that I've been uh, writing and verifying to do um, to do cryptographic operations. I don't expect you to actually understand all this, but just to give you a, a flavor of what it looks like, this is this is just comments. Um, after the semicolon. But essentially, we're in a situation where we have a, a single word, which we can um, call C, it's just an alias for a register. And basically that register is either all ones or all zeros, depending on a case split that we need to do in the code. So if the thing is all ones, we need to do a corrective addition. If it is all zeros, we don't need to do the corrective addition. And in a more traditional programming setting, you just say, you know, if, C equals zero, do one thing, otherwise do, do something else or do nothing. Um, but here all that uh, control gets moved into the data. So we actually use C as a bit mask. So for example, we set up various constants like this Q and we then and it with this thing as a mask so that it essentially blanks it out if this bit mask is zero. And then, so effectively we're moving things from um, from the control flow or from, uh, uh, from yes, from, from essentially making if then else type decisions to just changing the data itself. And then we're just using these, these masked operations to do various conventional um, arithmetic operations like subtraction, subtraction with borrow uh, and so on. So it, it, the, the code has a slightly peculiar flavor um, in this setting, which has some impact on the verification, but broadly speaking, not much. In fact, if anything, it can make verification um, a bit easier because you need to worry less about control constructs, but it also means simulating somewhat intricate bitwise operations and the way bitwise operations mix with arithmetic operations as here is is important because, you know, here we're, you know, we're taking our bit mask, we're, we're ending it with things and then actually we're setting A to zero by XORing it with itself and then subtracting Q which just so happens will give the negation of this thing, except that it's already masked. And so it'll also be blanked out to zero and, and so on. So this, this is the kind of, the kind of setting. So, so if I contrast uh, what went before with the arithmetic on real numbers with the arithmetic on big nums, um, it looks as if it's a, a fairly clear case of uh, sort of regressive evolution. So I'm going from uh, this rich real number system to the more primitive uh, world of the natural numbers. Of course, the reality is a bit more nuanced than that, although it's true that the, the reals are a much richer structure than the integers. Um, in the programming setting, we were mainly interested not in the real reals, but in floating point um, reals, and they're a finite subset of the reals, and they're Mathematical properties and perhaps you might say not as clean uh, 
So in the floating point setting, it's a it's a banality that many traditional algebraic laws essentially don't hold anymore. You know, it's not the case that if you take floating point numbers x, y, and z, that you know adding them right associated gives you the same result as adding them left associative. For I travel arithmetic, it is more or less true that the commutative law holds x plus y equals y plus x. I mean, except for depends exactly what you mean by um, equality on not a numbers, but um, that one at least is more or less true, but most of them aren't. And in floating point arithmetic, the concept of floating point rounding very much comes to the fore where you're, if, where at least from a mathematical point of view, many of your operations are taking a pure mathematical result and rounding it into this set of floating point numbers. So in the, in the setting of, of cryptography, um, we, uh, at least for our purposes, we're mainly concerned with the integers modulo n, which I, I'm calling zn here. I guess there are a few different notations for it. Um, and compared with the floating point numbers, this in some sense is nicer because it is at least a ring. Um, and in cases where n is a prime number, it's even a field. So you have multiplicative inverses modulo modulo n where, where n is a prime number. Um, for some applications, we're using um, different structures that are built on top of modular arithmetic, like elliptic curves over finite fields. Um, but for most of our work, we're roughly speaking, uh, grounding it in the integers modulo n. There are certainly plenty of cases in cryptography where one uses more interesting finite fields, but those uh, currently haven't been, been a focus in my work. So these worlds look very different, but one thing that I have dimly started to appreciate myself over time is that there's quite an interesting analogy between what you might call, I, I, I just uh, invented these um, labels, they're maybe not the best possible labels, between uh, concepts over the real numbers where in some sense some metric is getting, some number is getting smaller. In other words, you know, an approximation is getting more accurate closer to the real mathematical answer. And there are analogous situations over the integers where you sort of have the same thing going on, but in a what you might call a p-adic valuation. In other words, instead of some error getting smaller, your error, your error, something is getting more divisible by say a power of two, like getting more divisible by higher powers of two, something like that. I'll, I'll make that a bit more precise in, in an example later. And so at first sight, the algorithms used in these two domains of, of floating point arithmetic and um, integer arithmetic look very different, but there are some common themes. And if you look at things in this parallel setting, there are some quite striking analogies. That, this is actually nicely brought out by there's this nice book by Brenton Zimmerman called Modern Computer Arithmetic, and they have this little table um, where they sort of show in parallel what they consider um, sort of MSB and LSB algorithms, so most significant bit and least significant bit algorithms. And many things that are familiar in one setting actually have an analog in the other setting. Uh, so for example, uh, one that I'll belabor a bit later on in my talk is the connection between Newton's method and, and Hensel lifting. And so I'll show how in my two different settings, the same kinds of ideas do, do reappear. So in my work, I have been using my own uh, pet theorem prove our whole light. Um, and I probably don't need to spend too much time for this audience talking in detail about what whole light is. It's one of the very large family of whole systems that were originally developed by my my PhD advisor, the late Mike Gordon back in the 1980s. Um, so it's, it's an LCF style proof checker for essentially simple type theory, um, high, higher order logic built on top of simply type lambda calculus. Compared to the other holes, whole light was designed to have relatively simple, clean logical foundations. So it has a pretty small logical kernel, which is conceptually nice at least. Um, 
and it's written in in OCaml, which also serves as the the interaction language. So those of you who don't use Hull might be a bit bewildered by all the different uh, Hull provers. So in my attempt either to illuminate things or bewilder you a bit more, um, this is what you might call the, the Hull family DAG. It's not really a tree because there are quite a lot of uh, more complicated relationships, but most of the current Hull versions trace their origins back to, to Hull 88, which was the first uh, polished version of Mike Gordon's many um, early prototypes. And that, that inspired a number of um, cleaner re-implementations in standard ML, notably Hull 90 and proof power. And also thanks to Tobias Nipko, an instantiation of the Isabel prover for roughly speaking the same logic or a slight extension of it. And that of course is, has now developed into a, a big system in its own right. So Hull Light started life as an attempt to further simplify um, what was already done in Hull 90. And that in its turn has provided some ideas and code that appears in, in other systems. So in all these verifications, we're in a kind of mathematical domain and therefore quite a lot of important foundational work for these verifications involves just formalizing mathematics. Um, and often more mathematics than you might expect. So uh, it, it's been a surprise to me. I mean, since I like formalizing mathematics, a perfectly pleasant surprise that for these quite concrete applications for real code for real applications, um, you end you do end up needing to formalize quite a lot of traditional pure mathematics. For floating point, this was most obviously things around real analysis. For example, if you want to prove what a floating point sine function is supposed to do, for example, um, you at least need to have some underlying theory of what the um, mathematical ideal sine function is supposed to be like. And then floating point arithmetic brings up all these questions around floating point rounding that you need, you know, you need to analyze and reason about the concept of floating point rounding. But also, even in the floating point world, elementary number theory comes up quite a bit more than you might expect, because sometimes you show that a certain real number result is accurate by considering um, some kind of Diophantine properties of the, you know, the, the underlying um, floating point significance and, and doing some analysis of that sort. So although that was dominated by real analysis and related fields, there is a certain amount of uh, elementary number theory involved there too. For the crypto big nums, um, as you might guess, I've had to formalize more number theory. So um, I'm, I give some links here to, to some of the actual Hull light uh, formalizations around these areas. Uh, so for example, for um, for some of the code that I've been verifying for doing uh, pseudo prime tests, uh, you need formalizations of what you know pseudo primes of various kinds. I know the strong pseudo primes like Miller Rubin pseudo primes. Um, also, there's some formalization around elementary group theory. So for a long time in Hull Light, I did lots of interesting mathematics and somehow always managed to avoid formalizing group theory, but, um, but now two different uh, domains have finally caught up with me and made me formalize group theory. So first I was interested in homology theory and topology. And so I ended up formalizing some fairly basic stuff about uh, group theory in order to support that. And then for the work I've been doing recently, I've been needing to formalize basic properties of elliptic curve groups because of their applications in cryptography. And so again, I needed needed to do some group theory. Um, and, and so the, the mathematics you need is, I mean, mostly fairly fairly elementary, but, so, but sometimes quite interesting. Um, so, so here's here's a nice example that that came up um, in some of the formalizations I was doing around elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, I mean, for those of you who don't know elliptic curves, I certainly can't really uh, explain them in the in the space of a couple of minutes. But um, 
to a first approximation, you can imagine elliptic curves as being um, points in two-dimensional space satisfying some uh, equation of this form. These are for the the, the minus three, uh, the particular constant minus three comes up in a lot of the um, NIST recommended curves that are used in cryptography like the P256, P384. Um, but in general, elliptic curves can be can be uh, more general than this. Um, so if, if you imagine elliptic curves over the real numbers, you could you know draw their graphs, and you you know they, they would look something like this because it's of the form y squared equals cubic. Um, there's this kind of mirror symmetry in the in the y axis, um, and what makes elliptic curves particularly interesting is that you have a geometrically motivated group law where if you take two points on a curve you, there's a geometric construction which effectively turns this curve you know with a point at infinity added into an abelian group so if you take two two points p and q on a curve um you can essentially add them together by finding the third point where they intersect the curve and then flipping the the y coordinate uh, so uh, I won't go into the details, but the interesting question is, um, these pictures are over the real numbers, but in cryptography, we're actually interested in points over um, finite fields, in particular for the NIST curves that I'm interested in for points in the integers modulo P, where P is a prime. And the question actually arises, how many points are there on the curve Right, so if all the coordinates are restricted to points to integers modulo p, and you do all the arithmetic on integers modulo p, how many points are there? This is actually quite a well-studied mathematical question, and there's a theorem from Hasse which says that, roughly speaking, if there are p elements in your underlying field, in other words, your underlying field is the, uh, the integers modulo p, um, I mean, th this is true actually for uh, a broader set of ground fields, but I'm just interested in integers modulo p. Um, then, roughly speaking, the number of points on the curve is approximately p, so it's actually sort of within twice the square root of p of p, something like that. Um, and heuristically, this makes good sense because um, basically for every x-coordinate, um, if you have a y-coordinate on the curve, um, then you certainly have two of them because of this symmetry. Um, and you might naively guess that it's a 50-50 shot whether a given um, element over a finite field, you know, if you plug in an X value, whether there is in fact a, a square root, you know, whether it's a quadratic residue or not, you might guess it's roughly a 50-50 shot. And then every time you do have a point, you have two of them. So on average, you get roughly P. So it makes intuitive sense. But it's not exactly p. Uh, so, for example, for the NIST curve p two fifty six, you know, it's some magic number, and it turns out that for actual practical formalization reasons, you need to verify how many points there are on this curve because that comes up in some actual implementation details. Um, and without formalizing the Hassa bound, which looked like relatively hard work, there's there's quite a lot of, of work involved in proving how many points there are on a, on the elliptic curve. So um, for, for example, the results like this one, that there are exactly N256, where that's that magic number points in this particular P256 curve group. Um, this is roughly, I, I won't go into the details, but th these are roughly the steps I had to take. Um, so you have this elliptic curve group G and you're trying to prove it has size N. Um, so first of all, we proved that n is a prime number, that a nice property of these NIST curves is they're all prime order. So actually the, the groups are actually cyclic groups, very uh, kind of heavily disguised. Um, and you do that using a formal certificate. You pick some point on the curve as a generator. Since it's a cyclic group, basically anything but the identity will do. And you, you can pick a number out from the NIST documentation or, or find one yourself. You show basically that if you um, multiply that generator by n, or if you think of it multiplicatively, raise the generator to the nth power, you get the identity element. Um, 
that means that n is a multiple of the order of that element g, but because we know n is prime, that means it actually must be that order. Then by a standard property of group theory, the order of every element divides the order of the group. So that tells us that the order of the group is certainly some integral multiple of that number n. Um, just using a very naive bound, not going to the extent of the Hasse bound, you can see that it's that the size of G can't be much more than 2n because n is very close to the uh, or the size of the underlying field. Um, so we're in a situation where we know G is some multiple of n, some integer multiple of n, which is less than three. So all we need to do is rule out the case G equals 2n. Um, and if G is equal to 2n, there would be actually an element of order two by, by Cauchy's theorem, for example. In other words, there'd be some element that is equal to its own negation. And if you look at what negation means in the setting of elliptic curves, that basically means you flip the Y coordinate sign. And so if an element is equal to its own negation, it must be a point on the curve with Y equals zero. And then you actually have to do some um, fiddling around with polynomial GCDs to show there aren't any um, points satisfying this. Um, this is just a trick for showing that you have no roots over finite fields because um, by, by Fermat's little theorem, um, x to the p minus x is going to be true over um, field of size p and, and so on. So that gives you an idea that um, this topic, how many points are there on an elliptic curve, which was studied by pure mathematicians is actually um, in concrete instantiations quite useful for uh, justifying some optimizations on um, in real implementations, for example, this can be used to reduce um, uh, the index modular n when doing uh, point multiplication in elliptic curves. Uh, the fact that there's no element of order two, which is kind of, it's a chicken and egg thing, but it follows easily from the fact that the uh, the size is, is, a, is an odd prime. That justifies the fact that you know that you're never going to get y equal to zero and that allows you to make some other optimizations uh, and so on. So in the two different settings of floating point arithmetic and integers, I found it very useful to have some customized inference rules for specific problems. Uh, in floating point verifications, examples that came up were um, you know, verifying that some congruences have solutions, proving primality of particular numbers. That also came up in the example I just showed you with elliptic curves where you wanted to prove that the order of the group is a prime number. Um, in floating point arithmetic, a very common requirement was verifying error bounds in polynomial approximations. So, you know, if you approximate the sine function by a power series, what's the worst case error and things like that. That's something that doesn't come up in my cryptographic applications, but some of the other things do, like, like proving primality. And also, um, there's a lot more reasoning about general group theoretic things, and also specifically about congruences over natural numbers or integers. Um, and so reasoning about congruences is actually quite a big part of my day-to-day -day activity in verifying these crypto big nums. And one thing I found very useful is a decision procedure I came up with a while ago, actually um, published back in Cade some time ago. So in a, in a lot of uh, verification situations, we all know that linear arithmetic or sometimes nonlinear arithmetic is very useful. Um, in my setting, I'm doing a lot of reasoning about congruences. And there's a similar kind of substratum of basic properties of congruences that are a bit tedious to prove manually. And intuitively, when you get used to this area, you tend to just see that they're true immediately. And so it's very useful to have an automated tool analogous to Pressburg arithmetic for linear arithmetic that can prove these elementary properties of congruence is, you know, if if D divides A and D divides B, then D divides A minus B, or, you know, if if D is co-prime to A times B, that is, has no common factor with A times B, then it's co-prime, D is co-prime to A and so on. 
you know, canceling co-prime things from modulate from congruences, things like this, um, Chinese remainder theorem, etc. So I find it very useful to have automation for these kinds of things. And I use this pretty extensively. Um, if you want more about um, how this works, I, I have an old paper from, from Cade 21 about automating these proofs. But I, I've been very glad of this, this procedure because it saves a lot of quite tedious work proving elementary properties of congruences. So one common theme I, I would pick out of these two worlds is the value of having some kind of formal notion of interval arithmetic. In other words, just being able to prove in a purely formal setting some bounds on expressions. So on, on the floating point side, like a lot of more elementary arguments or sort of first approximation type arguments can be done by just saying, you know, if you're doing some calculation on floating point numbers that don't denormalize, then roughly speaking, you just get the exact mathematical answer times one plus epsilon, where epsilon has some, some bound. And so then you can just see what kind of error you get in a composite expression by naively composing them using the triangle law. Um, and although this is crude, it's quite often useful as a tool. Um, in the crypto big num work, you might think you're not in a setting where interval arithmetic would be very interesting, but this is not so actually, because very often you have big things like multiplier arrays that are essentially creating carry chains where you're adding a multi multiplying and adding multi-word entities and using the carry flag to, to link the uh, carries from the various stages. And sometimes you're throwing away uh, carries that look as if they're necessary, but the designer knows they're not necessary because of some range restriction. You know, you, you, for example, you know, you know, if you, if you, you know, you multiply, a, say, a five digit number by a one digit number, you know that your result fits in six digits. And so you're not getting any carry out of the top of your, you know, sixth digit and so on. Um, and similarly, you can justify this automatically using um, this type of formal interval arithmetic. So that's that's very useful in both worlds. Um, possibly the most elementary example of all, elementary but quite commonly used, is if you use one of the low-level machine instructions to multiply two machine integers and get a two-part answer. So imagine you take two 64-bit numbers, say x and y, and you multiply them to get a high part and a low part. So you can think of the exact x times y as Two to the 64 h plus l um, then it actually turns out that h cannot be um, all ones just by basic uh, range reasoning because the largest possible value for both x and y is 2 to the 64 minus 1 and so if you just do a bit of uh, range arithmetic you can figure out you can always afford to add 1 to h without causing an extra carry uh, and things like this are used quite often and it's very useful if the machine can um, justify them automatically. So I, I promised earlier to talk a little bit about this analogy between the sort of uh, metrical and piadic notions in the two worlds. And I think Newton's method is, is a nice example. A, a lot of the work I did in uh, floating, the floating point world is using something like uh, Newton's method um, to do various floating point operations. Um, so imagine uh, the, world of float, the world of floating point and you want to calculate reciprocals. So you're given a, a number A and you want to calculate one over A. I'll, for simplicity, I'll sort of somewhat freely pass between pure mathematics and floating point because I don't want to dwell too much on rounding errors and obscure the main issue, but um, you can find more, more details in some of my papers. The usual way these Newton-based um, algorithms go is to start with some initial approximation that you maybe get from a table or using some very crude initial hack, um, which gives you a first approximation which has some relative error epsilon. Uh, 
And then you effectively do a Newton step. This is a very special case of Newton's method, but it turns out if you do um, E equals one minus A times Y, so you take your initial version, you multiply it by A and subtract that from one, that gives you an error estimate. It actually turns out if you do the algebra that that roughly gives you minus epsilon. What that means is that you can then do another iterative step multiplying y by one plus e, where e is now your floating point value, say. Um, and then as usual with Newton's method, you get this kind of quadratic convergence. So your second approximation is more like uh, one over a times one plus epsilon, one minus epsilon, so you've squared the, the error. And if your error started small, it gets smaller um, quadratically. <clears throat> this is the classic uh, quadratic convergence that you associate with Newton's method once you get a good initial approximation. So exactly the same concept pops up in the um, integer world. Um, and here's, here's a real example. It, it, looks, um, it looks simple, but it actually comes up in, in cryptography. Suppose you're given a 64-bit um, odd integer A. Your job is to find a negated modular inverse for it, modulo 2 to the 64. In other words, find some other 64-bit words such that when you multiply the two things together, you get minus 1 modulo 2 to the 64. In other words, if you just do these things using machine arithmetic and losing everything modulo 2 to the 64, then a times x will give you, you know, all ones or minus one, depending how you think of it. And this is a real uh, requirement in, for example, Montgomery multiplication as used in, in RSA and some other uh, implementations. And you can solve this using effectively the same thing except in this setting, it's known as Hensel lifting, but it's really exactly just the p-adic analog of Newton's method. So here's how, here's one possible solution. As usual with these things, you need to start with an initial approximation. And it just so happens that there's the following magical sequence, which gives you a five-bit negated modular inverse. So if you start with an odd number A um, and you do this, this is in C syntax, so you're shifting left two spaces, subtracting it from the original number, and then you're XORing it with two. This is, this is C syntax, it's not a power of two. Um, it just so happens that will give you a five-bit negated modular inverse. In other words, you get some value such that AX is congruent to minus one modulo two to the five. Um, and so in exactly the same way as with Newton's method, we can then iteratively refine that to be better. And roughly, it's just the same kind of steps. Um, if you have an initial step, you can do a very analogous uh, Newton step. I won't go into the algebra in detail, but essentially the same thing works. Um, the only difference is we flip the sign because we're actually looking for AX is congruent to minus one, not plus one. But essentially doing the same kind of Newton step turns out to give you something, if you start with something which is a k-bit negated modular inverse, your next approximation is a 2k bit negated modular inverse. So exactly the same kind of thing works. So in exactly the same way as in the floating point world, you can start with some initial approximation out of a table and then successively refine it. Here you can start with just this, this magic hack at the beginning and then successively refine it to give the right answer or to give your answer modulo 2 to the uh, 64, which is what you want. So it's very interesting, I think, how uh, we seem to be in very different worlds, but just with this slight change of perspective from the conventional metric to the, the p-adic metric, um, the same kind of ideas reappear. And then there are elaborations of this technique, which I probably won't go into in much detail, but you can, there are variants of Newton's method like Goldschmidt's, where you are decoupling the computations to a greater extent by calculating the error in the n plus one stage in parallel with calculating the actual answer in the n plus one stage. And in the floating point setting, this causes some additional complications because your rounding errors can cause things to become decoupled. But here we're just over the integers, so everything works quite smoothly. So here, uh, for example, is a full solution to the original problem. 
Uh, so you can start with this initial approximation and then just do a bunch of fairly simple um, integer operations. And at the end of the day, you get the right answer. So, so that's a bit of the um, mathematical similarity and differences in my two worlds. What about other um, aspects? Well, one interesting thing about formalizing arithmetic in any kind of sense is that it is at least relatively easy to know what the correct answer is. If you think of the traditional approach to formal verification, um, it's very common to think of it in terms of these four boxes. Uh, so what you're actually interested in doing is proving that some actual system verifies some actual requirements, but what you're actually doing is formalizing some model of the actual system, your, your model of the design, and you have some formal version of your specification, and what your formal proof is doing is actually just connecting these two things. <clears throat> And of course, you still need to worry, um, does my formal specification capture what my actual requirements are, or does my design model capture my actual system? So in the world of for formal verification in general, um, this top gap is probably the most significant one. I mean, very often it's extremely difficult to formalize requirements. But one of the nice things about formalizing arithmetic is this is almost trivial because it's just traditional pure mathematics. Um, so the difficulties arise more, is the design model accurately reflecting the actual system? Um, so at the moment, um, the verifications that I'm concerned with are mainly for uh, machine code, which is either um, x86-64 or ARM-8, that is the 64-bit version of ARM. And fundamentally, the model we're taking is just a relatively simple um, you know, transcription of what the uh, instruction set architecture of the machine says. So for example, on the x86, this is what an add instruction does. You know, it reads the, uh, the input, it calculates some word operation that is the output, and it writes the output writes to the destination what the answer is, and it also sets some flags according to, you know, various more or less obscure characteristics. You know, it sets the zero flag if the result is zero. It sets the carry flag if um, the result that you get is not the same as the sum of the two inputs, and then there are other more obscure uh, flag settings. And so the model is reasonably accurate it's uh, it's trying to re it's trying to accurately reflect what should be undetermined according to the instruction set architecture but of course it's abstracting away certain fairly simple details um, and so what I'm doing in my current work is essentially verifying pre-existing machine code rather than verify rather than auto generating code that's so to speak correct by construction. The advantage of doing this is that it doesn't depend at all on, well, the, well, there are several advantages. So it doesn't depend, this doesn't depend at all on the correctness of your compiler or even of your macro assembler, because I'm actually starting from the machine code itself. Um, this makes it much easier to verify code that's been handwritten and hand tuned, which in these low level cryptographic kernels is quite important because it's very hard to get C compilers, even quite clever ones, to generate exactly the code you want to use the low level features in exactly the right way. It also means in some sense, the prover infrastructure is irrelevant to using the code. So you can still treat the code as just ordinary human readable code and you don't need to know anything about theorem provers to use it or even potentially to modify it. Of course, you need to know about theorem provers if you want to verify the modified version. Uh, the downside is, of course, it's a lot more work writing code at the machine level, and also for the verifications, you're dealing with a less structured representation where it can be more difficult to, um, to navigate things. Um, and according to taste, this is either a good feature or a bad feature. You get very low level specifications that actually tell you things like, you know, this is the exact number of stack frames you use, you know, this is the 
the program counter offset and these are the particular registers used. So at the one level, this keeps the specifications explicit, but on the other hand, it can also be a bewildering mass of detail. Um, and my, my top level results are all stated in the form of these somewhat elaborated Hoare triples where you have roughly a precondition, a post condition and a third field, which is a frame condition. This is essentially telling you what fields may get modified. Since I showed you this earlier example of a negated modular inverse function, this is what the machine code specification for an implementation of that looks like. Uh, this is um, the ARM version. Uh, so you can see from the ARM here. So it basically says, you know, if this program, which is a separate definition, is loaded as a aligned sequence of bytes at some program counter PC, and the machine's program counter points to PC, and the X0 register in that initial state contains a value A, which we're assuming is a word representing an odd number, then you get into a, a final state where the program count is moved on by 48 words. Um, and basically your answer, which is here, um, satisfies the congruence. You expect that A times that plus one is congruent to one modulo two to the 64. And these are the state components it may change. So the, the, this third field about this number, about the things that may change makes it relatively easy to compose these results. So if you have, say, a function call, you can just understand a priori that your function call isn't affecting certain other fields. And so um, it gives you some way of proving non-interference. So one thing I'm not at the moment using is any kind of separation logic. So I'm keeping everything explicit um, and explicitly talking about which memory regions need to not overlap each other. So this does mean you need to write sometimes some quite uh, detailed non-aliasing hypotheses on theorems. Um, on the other hand, these are mostly proved automatically anyway. And it keeps your, ver your specifications explicit and also quite flexible because sometimes things are optimized for cases where things may overlap, but overlap in special ways. So uh, to give one example, here's a specification for a six word by six word multiplier giving a 12 word result. And, you know, I don't want to read the specification in detail, but it sort of basically says the output is equal to A times B if the inputs are A and B. Um, but looking at the non-overlapping assumptions, um, there's some assumptions that the output doesn't overlap the inputs. However, it's also permissible for the output to be one of the inputs. This arises because the implementation is essentially eating words right to left and producing words right to left. So provided things are exactly equal, um, it doesn't matter if the input and the output field overlap. This means you can optimize storage by for example, reusing the same buffer for your input, for one of the inputs and the outputs. So it gives you this kind of flexibility. And so the verification process is essentially a combination of using floyd hoare type reasoning um, for doing top level decomposition, things like loop invariance and, and um, sequencing. But then the low level proof is mostly done by symbolic simulation, uh, which deals for you with a lot of the everyday details of just updating the machine state when you do a sequence of operations. Um, but it maintains that state in a symbolic representation. Uh, so, I mean, an example of the kind of Hoare rule, which is like the sequencing rule from traditional Hoare logics is in the negated modular inverse function, you split the proof into two, uh, one bit for the initial approximation, which is just a piece of magic. Um, and the second part, which is the kind of congruence reasoning, the, the Hensel lifting. And although both parts can be done automatically, they're done automatically using very different techniques. The first bit is basically just a case analysis, bit blasting, if you like. The second part is, is congruences. And so this very naturally splits the proof into those two parts that can be, be tackled separately. Um, and it's, it's important, I think, to have some kind of continuous integration so that you really know you're verifying what is actually um, also being run. So currently, um, 
we're actually directly generating the code to be verified from the object file. So the definitions look something like this. Uh, so the negated modular inverse function that I showed you is really just defined as a sequence of actual numbers and the instruction decoding of ARM is all part of the formalization. Um, but as well as being a definition, this this definition is really just a placeholder. The definition can be derived automatically from the .o file, and this is done here. Um, this is just um, only stated at all as a kind of permanent record of what it should look like. And so when you run the proof, uh, this stage actually looks for the .o file, um, looks at what's in the text segment and to, to a limited extent, the relocation information and checks that you're really verifying that this code is indeed what's at the correct point in that that file. And this this is uh, a relatively recent addition that's been um, largely the work of Mario Carnero, who, who's been working with me on this for, for the last few months uh, um, uh, in an internship. And so the very nice feature of this is you really have a good assurance that you're verifying the actual code. Okay, so that's essentially, um, all I have, so let me just briefly run through some conclusions. So, so general purpose theorem provers like Hull Light and you know, insert your favorite theorem prover here are very indeed general purpose and you can apply them everywhere from the pure mathematics all the way down to the low level machine formalization. Um, any verifications in a mathematical domain like these give you a great excuse to formalize some interesting mathematics. And also, at least for me, um, often help to illuminate why certain fields of mathematics became interesting in the first place. You know, sometimes if you just read things in a textbook, they look very abstract and you wonder why would anyone ever have cared about that? But sometimes you find that you care directly because it's actually relevant to some, some verification result. Um, and although I've moved from the reals to the integers and these look like very different worlds, there are some quite interesting common themes and certain patterns like this Newton versus Hensel um, analogy crop up and show you that the worlds are maybe not quite as different as you think. So one extra thing I would say is I think programmability of the proof assistant is a really important boon since although it's amazing what can be done with automated solvers, very often the problems we need to solve in these domains are not those that perfectly fit some exact uh, off-the-shelf solver and you need to implement some more specific functionality and you need to do it in a sound way. So I think the programmability of the proof assistant is also very, very valuable. Okay, and that is the end of my talk. So uh, thank you uh, for listening and I guess I can take questions if that works and we have time. Indeed. So th right. thanks for uh, John. We have two minutes officially until the end of the live stream, but I guess we can go further because the next session starts at 16.45. So uh, you need to raise your hand uh, or uh, write a question into the question and answer window. And we have the first one from Kun Klaassen. So he asks, is it important for you to be able to find counterexamples when proving things? Uh, yes, that's, that's a, yeah, that, that is an interesting question. So yes, um, it, it often is, and I, I find an interactive proof this often, this doesn't just, just happen in the way it, it typically does happen with model checking. So very often, the way we're tackling problems in this domain is we're trying a certain proof strategy that we expect to work. And if it doesn't work, very often in general, we're still in some doubt over whether um, there is a true counterexample or whether um, it's just that our particular proof strategy didn't work in this particular instance. Um, but in general, yes, that is very, um, is very useful having counterexamples. So uh, I wouldn't say that is something that always works perfectly smoothly. So I have hit situations where, yes, yeah, some proof doesn't work and I had to uh, 
so to speak, separately approach the question of whether there's a true counterexample. Um, and and very often, very often this is this is difficult. So so yes, better um, better techniques there would certainly be be valuable. Um, but yes, it's it's an important question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have the next question from Frank Widek. Uh, he is uh, asking, did you find any problems in the code that you verified or turned everything always to be okay already? So, uh, no, I, I do find problems in the code. So uh, I, I have the pleasant luxury that very often I'm verifying code that I have written. So I'm finding my own mistakes. The big advantage of verifying your own code is that you have a high level of understanding what's going on and you don't need to, so to speak, reverse engineer it. Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I am verifying other people's code too. And yes, problems do come up. Um, and sometimes they are exactly the kind of problems that bring back the previous question, namely, you can't make the, there are situations where you can't make the proof go through in the way you expect it to make it go through. And yet you aren't actually always sure a priori whether there's actually a counterexample. So I've had one case where uh, the proof didn't work and I was not able to uh, find a correct proof. And this did indeed point to the fact that I'd made an error in the code. Um, on the other hand, although I'd made a conceptual error, it still wasn't actually clear to me whether the whether what I'd done would have been sufficient in practice. So that this would have, so so insofar as it is a bug, it would have been a very subtle one because even I am not quite sure whether there's any um, example that brings it up in practice. But it certainly was a case where I did something I did not intend to do. I actually effectively was doing a less than or equal test in a case where I should have done a less than test. I mean, a classic sort of off by one type error. So yes, the short answer is yes, I, I do find problems. Um, usually the code that I'm verifying is either already somewhat well tested or I have written it myself and also subjected it to some testing, which is reasonably rigorous, you know, trying a lot of obscure corner cases first. So usually the elementary problems have been flushed out. And so the problems I'm finding tend to be the, the more mathematically subtle ones where you know, you, you lost a carry somewhere in some very tricky situation where it's actually not immediately obvious whether it ever comes up in practice, but in principle, you, you're losing a carry. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Michael Beeson. Why exactly does AWS care about verifying cryptography? Um, I, I think... Uh, I mean, we, we certainly care a lot about uh, improving the assurance of systems at all levels and making sure we can have a reliable approach to um, some of the core functionality. I mean, if you, if you drill down into all the situations where we're relying on um, a lot of this cryptographic code, it's all over the place. Um, you know, it's used every time anyone connects to an EC2 instance, it's used by all the sort of web connections and so on. So this is something that we view as a an important foundation for a lot of the other stuff that goes on in AWS and in the computing industry generally. Um, and it's, it's clearly in our interests to make sure that this stuff uh, is as reliable and secure as possible. So... Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of good code either in the public domain or in our, you know, in various private places. Um, but it's also well known that some of these uh, public um, codes have had high profile issues either around correctness or about side channels. I and mean, if you just uh, look at some of the security blogs, you find lots of cases where um, some of the off the shelf code has problems in this area. And so, um, it's important for us um, as as providers and users of computing infrastructure. Uh, so, so maybe a f follow up to, to to that, like, is 
any of the formalization that you do already some sort of publicly verified, um, let's say, tool that I could use, like instead of some implementation of, let's say, open SSL or whatever? Not at the moment, but um, I'm currently working on issues around the release, so I hope to have uh, some progress uh, in the coming months in actually getting more of this stuff into the public domain. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. So the next question is from Deepak Kapoor. John, you mentioned common themes in integers, rails, floating rails, periodic systems, which is very useful. Are there new algebraic structures hidden which need to be identified and investigated? Yeah, that is an interesting question. It's probably too difficult for me to come up with an answer off the top of my head, but it's it's certainly quite possible. I mean, um, I mean, I think if you'd gone back far enough and told people that you know elliptic curves would be as important as they are in in cryptography people would have been skeptical um so in some sense elliptic curves turned out to be a very um a productive source of sort of abelian groups if you like um probably there will be new underlying algebraic ideas that will underlie some of the new developments i mean one area I don't know much about is um, the development of of quantum safe cryptography. This is a topic of some current interest because there's concerns that you know if quantum computers reach a certain level of capacity, they may start to break existing crypto systems, um, and those may bring up some additional mathematics. Whether the verification process itself will bring out any new areas of mathematics, I, I don't know. It would be nice to think so, but I, I certainly couldn't confidently predict it. Mm -hmm. So may, maybe a follow-up, which also Marco Magiesi is asking, what, what about the organization of the hierarchy of al algebraic structures, group strings, etc.? Did you find it critical in your work? And maybe what I would add, like, whole light is well known as sort of a bare bones um, proof assistant. So now, now you are doing something where uh, you might, for example, think about a type class of uh, what Deepak was saying, right? Let that you see some sort of high level analogy between between the two two worlds. Like, did, did it lead you to, to some uh improvements of the bare bones whole light infrastructure or you remain faithful to <laughs> to your minimalistic approach um so whole light still is somewhat minimalistic on the other hand it certainly motivated a lot of developments of of abstract algebra and so uh some of the existing decision procedures that i previously had say just for the reals or just for the integers I've had to generalize. So in particular for the elliptic curves, um, I had to generalize some of the kind of Grosvenor basis based word problem solvers to work over an arbitrary fee, uh, arbitrary integral domain or arbitrary ring. Um, and so that, that was quite a lot of work. So, so to some extent I could leverage the existing infrastructure, but I had to work on it. I mean, in foundational terms, I have not been greatly tempted to add um, new features to reflect the algebraic hierarchy. So I'm satisfied with the bare bones um, formalization. It does mean that my formalizations in say group theory and ring theory perhaps look a bit too verbose and explicit for everyone's tastes. You know, every time you write an ad, it's um, parameterized, subscripted, if you like, by the, the group. Um, so there's a certain syntactic load that I have not thought it worth hiding. Um, and for most purposes, I'm, I'm quite happy with this. I mean, in some ways, I think I'm happy to stick with conceptual simplicity and explicitness at the expense of a little bit of, you know, somewhat superficial pleasantness, if you like. Uh, uh, Charit Weber, John, thank, thank you for this nice talk. 
going beyond functional correctness, do you have any thoughts on verifying security side channel related properties? Uh, yeah, that, that is a good question. So uh, I did, I, I said right at the beginning that this cryptographic code was designed in a constant time style, but the fact that it is in any sense constant time is not verified, that is so to speak true by inspection because there's no control flow or based on the data. Um, but this leaves open a lot of questions. So first of all, um, can we really rely on the underlying microarchitecture to always execute um, instructions in the same time? I mean, there are certainly particular cases for instructions that I don't use like division where special cases are treated separately. I mean, if only because division by zero is actually trapped, for example. Um, and so there are a lot of subtle questions around the interface between the microarchitecture and the, the high level code. Um, so when code is somewhat globally described as constant time, that deserves a lot of elaboration. And at the moment, none of this is, is formalized. There has been some uh, previous work at AWS on a tool that was actually trying to analyze timing behavior of code using an LL LLVM cost model and using solvers to, you know, um, analyze how different um, the nominal timing was on different paths. And so I think this is potentially a very rich area so that one could actually bring timing behavior under the purview of formalization. Um, and that's purely for timing behavior. I know there are lots of other interesting potential security side channels and certainly being able to analyze any of those in a formal setting is is interesting on the other hand also potentially very difficult because it's a it's an extremely open-ended world i mean if you look at the history of verification in the 70s i think one of the big disillusioning factors in things like operating system uh, and security verification that was a big motivation for the the funding agencies in the early days was the difficulty of these of saying anything about side channels because it's such a kind of open-ended world you know even if you prove your operating system is, you know, in, in some abstract setting, giving you good isolation, you know, how do you know one of the users isn't doing some weird timing side channel with the code he's executing or something like that? Um, so it's a very interesting, but also potentially very difficult and open-ended problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Lars Holstrom, minor tip, not a question, the, the metric versus p-adic dichotomy is usually called Archimedean versus non-Archimedean in the literature. The Archimedean property in question being that one can create arbitrarily large values by adding one to itself enough times. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Yes, perhaps that would be a, would be a, a better tag. Yes. It also depends. I mean, in the in the algorithmic setting, talking about sort of most significant bit, least significant bit um, is also a common tag. But yes, perhaps Archimedean, non-Archimedean would be a better phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, Hans de Neville. Hello, thanks for, for your talk. Cryptographical algorithms often have requirement that they leave no footprint in memory. Do you verify that also? Yes, to some extent, yes. So, for example, some some of the actual, I mean, in cases where this is part of the specification, then yes, that's also verified. So, in particular, some of the some of the high level things that I verified do have an explicit clause in the specification that says exactly something like, you know, after execution all the you know, temporary buffer has been cleared to zeros and all these registers have been cleared to zeros and so on. Um, and the fact that the way I state the specifications has this frame condition, that can also do double duty as um, circumscribing quite sharply which fields of memory get modified. Um, so generally speaking, yes, this is made explicit in the specification and I think the current formulation I have works quite well. One slightly subtle mismatch is that my field of, um, my frame condition field of things that may get modified is 
not exactly the same as the field of things that may get written to, because there are cases, for example, where you um, you save and restore a register, so it hasn't changed and therefore may not appear in this may change list, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't get assigned somewhere in the middle of the sequence. So there might be an argument for actually distinguishing those two things, that something gets modified and that it gets touched at all and therefore may get modified uh, in the middle of execution, because that may be relevant if if somehow your, your code can get interrupted in the middle. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question may be related from Frank. Uh, did you formally verify that your code is constant time or is that just how you informally write things? Uh, yeah, so, so this perhaps comes back to the earlier question. Yes, uh, at the moment this is, so to speak, by inspection, but I agree that actually in it is very obvious to me, I believe, by uh, construction, um, so roughly, so roughly speaking, the guiding principle is I'm doing operations on big nums that have some certain nominal size and have some data. And my guiding principle is that any control flow should depend only on the nominal size, not on the data. Um, and therefore it would behave exactly the same, even if you know you have a 48 word number that's all zeros, as if you had a 48 number that's some random number. Um, and it is sort of obvious, but as my code base has expanded and got more complicated, I've started to understand that that's maybe not entirely satisfactory and it would be better to have a way of bringing this into the purview of the verification. Um, but at the moment it is still by inspection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Deepak. Uh, what, what kind of new abstract algebras and Grebner basis on where it's were developed? And where are they discussed? Um, so the uh, the decision procedures for rings are more or less uh, standard in the Grebner basis uh, literature. Um, that is, you know, you're basically solving the word problem by reducing to ideal membership of some kind. Um, needless to say, the uh, the presentation in my book is is one place to look: uh, Handbook of Practical Logic and Automated Reasoning, but um, there's also a, a big older literature, which of course Deepak is better aware than I am. Um, the main change was just the refinement of potentially having a field with non-zero uh, characteristic because the existing stuff was all just assuming characteristic zero. So effectively all your you know, embedded integers were distinct. Um, but that, of course, uh, breaks down, and so I had to generalize that. Um, in other respects, so, so I, I, yes, I also have some specialist decision procedures for words, but they're of a more ad hoc character that are either doing um, fairly straightforward bitwise computation or reducing things to modular arithmetic. Um, they're not actually described anywhere, but I think those are relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. is, is all of the development public or you said that you are sort of preparing it for being published or how does it work? So, so the, the pure mathematical aspects are basically public and have mostly been ro rolled into the whole light distribution. So I had a, I had a few few links uh, early on, I think, where um, yeah. I showed you uh, uh -huh. yeah. where, to, where to find these in the, uh, the whole light distribution. I can find it there. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so, so here are a few examples of stuff that was motivated by this work uh, and the underlying pure mathematics has been rolled into whole light. The, um, the more um, application oriented details are not in the public domain yet, but as I was saying, I hope um, to be able to make most, if not all of it public uh, mm. in the coming months. Cool. Uh, Frank wants to win in the number of asked questions. So here's another one by him. How, how much reuse is there between the formalizations in the x86 and ARM worlds? A reasonable amount. So most of the underlying setting of a sort of relational model of state spaces is common. So actually the majority of it is common. Um, I mean, there are some more or less trivial differences between the two, but I think it's now, in my first version, 
they were almost totally disjoint and then I made a conscious effort to unify them. So now there is a larger um, unified code base that's used for both of them. Um, and I think, I think it's true to say that almost all of it is now, almost all the interesting stuff like the dealing with the aliasing of memory regions, the basic symbolic execution, um, you know, figuring out which bits of the state don't change when you state, uh, change some other bits of state, all that is generic. Um, so most of the, so to speak, interesting stuff is now generic, but I've, but only because I made a conscious effort and this is, so to speak, version two, the original version was, was much more uh, separated. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems we have run out of questions. Maybe one more by me. You you have mentioned Mario has been working with you. Is he is he now on top of being a lean and Matamath guru, also a whole light guru? Yes, yes. He seems uh, he seems to be able to be a guru in several systems simultaneously. So yeah, I've been very impressed with the work he's done in in whole light already. In fact, he's he's provided a very nice library for doing. Um, matching expressions over bits that's actually found its way into the whole light distribution already. Um, and yeah, behind the scenes, he's done an enormous amount on the um, the machine code formalization. Cool. Uh, all right. So I, I guess we should wrap it up because we are like 20 minutes over time. So thanks a lot, John, for this wonderful talk and for answering all, all the questions in this Insane, insane time in Portland. Thanks for waking up and um, doing all of this. And good luck with the project. We hope to see the published uh, formalizations and codes. Uh, and are, I guess many people are really very interested in, in seeing what it will look like when they will be running your verified version of SSL or uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, thanks again. So I will try to do applause here on from Jack. <laughs> and thank you very much for the for the invitation and, and for hosting so nicely. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs>